Welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Masanti, celebrating with you today the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Feast of the Body and Blood of Christ. Let's begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. Let's take a moment at the outset of Mass to look into our hearts and to confess our sins. For our failure to love as we should, Lord, have mercy. For the times we fail to reverence the Eucharist as we should, Christ, have mercy. For the good we mean to do but don't, the sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks to your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father, amen. And so we pray. Let us pray to the Lord who gives himself to us in the Eucharist, that this sacrament may bring us eternal salvation and personal peace. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and your death. May our worship of this sacrament in your body and blood help us to experience the salvation that you have won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. When Moses came to the people and related all the words and ordinances of the Lord, they all answered with one voice. We will do everything that the Lord has told us. Moses then wrote down all the words of the Lord, and rising early the next day, he erected it at the foot of the mountain an altar and twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. Then, having sent certain young men of the Israelites to offer holocausts and sacrifice young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord, Moses took half of the blood and put it in large bowls. The other half he splashed on the altar. Taking the book of the covenant, he read it aloud to the people, who answered, All that the Lord has said, we will heed and do. Then he took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words of his, the word of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. How shall I make a return to the Lord for all the good he has done for me? The cup of salvation I will take up, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have lost my bonds. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. To you will I offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving 
and I will call upon the name of the Lord. My vows to the Lord I will pay in the presence of all his people. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come to be, passing through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made by hands, that is, not belonging to this creation, he entered once for all into the sanctuary, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a heifer's ashes can sanctify those who are defiled so that their flesh is cleansed, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works to worship the living God? For this reason, he is mediator of a new covenant, since a death has taken place for deliverance from transgressions under the first covenant, those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. The word of the Lord. That came down from heaven, says the Lord. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. My friends, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a, a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found the just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And this is the gospel of our Lord. It's a delight to share with you the Feast of Corpus Christi, that time in which we celebrate the fact that simple bread and wine becomes for us the actual, the real presence of Jesus himself. And we'll talk more about that later. But let's first of all get into these readings and what they tell us. In this passage from the book of Exodus, the first reading, we've got Moses explaining that the way to honor God is by offering sacrifice. But as is made clear in this reading, those sacrifices involve not people doing for God, but rather a lot of poor animals dying for the sake of honoring God. So they would take animals to the temple and they would slaughter them and spread their blood as a way of saying, see God, we love you so much, willing to, willing to sacrifice. Willing to sacrifice not themselves, but willing to sacrifice the blood of the animals. And that's in contrast to 
the savior of the world, who says very clearly, in the past you were told to offer holocausts and sacrifices as an honor to God, but I teach you a new way. And so his sacrifice is the very offering of his life. You know, it's one thing for me to say, I'm going to do for you by offering somebody else's gifts or sacrifices. But when I offer myself for you, when I put myself in harm's way, when I'm willing to stand tall and give my life for you, that's true sacrifice. So it's an interesting contrast. In the book of Exodus, we see Moses leading his people and offering sacrifices, the slaughter of animals. Nice, but really not that impressive. But along comes Jesus who said, I'm not any longer asking you to sacrifice animals for God, but I, the Son of God, and a fellow human being, am willing to offer my very life for your salvation. You know, it's the contrast between kind of being in, sort of being in, and being all in. And the sacrifice of Christ, his offering of his very life, is a sign that he's all in for your salvation and for mine. There's another thing in this particular reading that I, I wouldn't want to miss because the people in Moses' time, hearing the instruction from God about offering sacrifice, they say twice in this reading, we will hear and we will do everything that the Lord has told us. So they're making a very, very important promise. We're going to do whatever God asks of us. And I'm thinking of it because that same promise applies to you and me. When we receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, we make a promise that this will be a regular part of our lives forever. I say all the time in May when we celebrate the First Communion for those children, this can't be a one-shot deal. The whole concept of eating is just that in your family and in mine, if we ate one meal and stopped eating, we'd die. In the same way, our meal together, the Eucharist, should be something that we experience time and time again so that we can be spiritually nourished. We make a promise when we accept the faith that we're going to be continuous in sharing the body and blood of Christ, receiving it into our lives, allowing its graces to work in us. So how come then only about a third of Catholics regularly go to communion or receive the sacrament? Now, I know some of you watching this Mass are homebound, and I hope you've arranged with your local parish so that Eucharistic ministers or priests or deacons can come and see you and bring you the living body of Jesus Christ. But the promise of the Old Testament people and our own promise is very similar. I'm going to do whatever God tells me. Well, the Lord God says, take and eat, take and drink. Not once, not a one-shot deal, not a once-a-year a thing, but a continuous meal that we share just like we take regular food that keeps us alive. So spiritually, we need to be people who keep on eating the food of life, the bread of life, the chalice of eternal salvation for our own welfare. So this sacrifice of Jesus is real. It's a giving of his own very life. But it's also a call to us in this reading to do it not once in a while, but to share in the Eucharist, his body, as often as we can. And then that second reading is a, the letter to, from St. Paul to the Hebrews. And I think the key line is, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And the new covenant, of course, is love. And it's a love demonstrated by the sacrifice he makes in his willingness to offer his very life for you and me and... The other part of his great gift of love is to say, and I am with you always until the end of time. How? Well, in many ways, certainly through his word, through his community, the faithful believers, but also importantly, through the very gift of his body and blood. You and I, if we receive mass or we receive Eucharist regularly at mass, we are offered the opportunity to have Christ in us, with us, as often as we receive that this isn't a thing where someday we hope to meet God again. We meet him in the sacrament on a regular basis so often as we welcome his body and blood into our lives. And finally, let's go to this great gospel of Mark. A um, couple of things. Jesus is very clear here. Take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. He doesn't say it's kind of like my body. He doesn't say it's sort of like my body. He doesn't say it's kind of a commemoration only, a memory of. But this is the actual transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. What, what about that don't we understand? Take and eat, this is my body. What's not clear about that? I mention that because for a lot of our other Christian denominations, they, they talk about it as a, a reminder meal. We're thinking back 2,000 years ago to when our Lord had the Last Supper. We're doing that. It is certainly a remembrance of the Last Supper, but it's so much more. It is the creation, once again, of the miracle of Eucharist, of the actual real presence of Jesus. 
I've, I've shared this story with you before, but it's always worth mentioning again because I think it resonates in your experience and mine. The film director, Frank Capra, everybody knows him. He won four Academy Awards for things like It's a Wonderful Life and Mr. Deeds Goes to Town and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and Lost Horizon and Arsenic and Old Lace. You can't take it with you. Great filmmaker. But he came from Sicily as a young immigrant, looked around and said, those immigrants who come from other countries, especially Italy, are generally poor and without power. I want to be successful in America. I want to be known and powerful and rich and popular. Catholics and immigrants don't seem to make it in America, so I'm going to leave the church, and he did. He joins any number of Protestant churches, and he goes, but he finds in that experience a certain hollowness and emptiness. He marries Lucille. Lucille is Lutheran. And one day, she wakes him up and says, get up, we're going down the block to St. Michael's Church. And he says, that's a Catholic church, why would we go there? Because she said, for a year, I have been secretly taking instruction. Today, I'm going to be welcomed into the Catholic Church. Today, our three children are going to be baptized into the church. And today, Frank Capra, my husband, who I love, you're going home. Because you will never be the man you're supposed to be until you return to the faith that you know is yours. And he did thanks to his wife, Lucille, the non-Catholic brought him back. But the important thing, he said the first thing he experienced on going back to Mass and confession before that was to experience reception of the Eucharist. And he said it was literally a physical sensation, a spiritual sensation. I realized what I'd been missing, that all those other churches that I was going through, they were fine. But compared to the Catholic Church, because of the Eucharist, he said, it made all the difference. I belonged home in the Catholic Church, where I wasn't just commemorating or remembering the Last Supper. I was partaking of the exact meal the apostles experienced by receiving the actual body and blood of Christ. I ask you, because I think for all of us, it can become so routine to even go to Mass and to receive, so our mind is even miles away. I see it sometimes when people come on the line to communion. They're not really there. I say, body of Christ, and then they refocus. Oh, amen. Let's get focused today on the Feast of Corpus Christi, on remembering what an awesome gift you have and I have been given in the Jesus who says, I am with you until the end of time, and gives us a very specific way of being with us in his real presence in the form of bread and wine, the actual body and blood of Christ. That's what we're celebrating today. How blessed are we to have such a God, to have such a sacrament. Okay, I want to talk about three other news items um, that are not necessarily uh, about the readings, but they may touch on some things that are in the readings as well. First of all, we had, uh, not that long ago, Bubba Watson on our program, personally speaking, a very successful uh, champion golfer. And then last week, Kevin Streelman, also an award winner on the golf circuit, two professional golfers. What was intriguing to me is that both of them admitted that they suffer from anxiety, and sometimes sadness and depression, and that sometimes they are generally unhappy people. Now, you would wonder why. They, they do well financially, they're popular, they're successful, but it reminded me of this story that surfaced this week about a young man, a professional golfer named Grayson Murray, who this week, at the age of 30, took his life. Another champion golfer, very successful, young, dynamic, seemingly with everything going for him. And his death at his own hand was tragic and heartbreaking for him and his family. But it reminded me of a couple of things that we always need to talk about when we hear a sad story like this. One is, don't fool yourself ever into believing that the things of this world, whether it's success or money or popularity or looks, are the real route to personal happiness. Because you can look at a person who seems to have it all and be unaware that they are suffering so many things inside of their soul and our job is not to ever presume anyone is happy and successful and at peace, but rather to approach every person as someone who needs our support and our love because we just don't know the burdens that they carry. And maybe another word, too, about suicide. There was a time in our church when a person who committed suicide was not permitted to have a Catholic funeral. And I am so happy that our church has come to realize that the depression that leads a person to be paralyzed and ultimately to take their life is not a sinful condition. Depression is not a moral choice. It is rather, unfortunately, an illness of the soul and the mind. 
And our church has said that God's mercy is so vast that it will cover for that person who's made a tragic mistake and taken their life. But even that person, because they are suffering a disease, the disease of depression, is welcome in the kingdom of heaven. That's something about our church and of evolution in our church that I love very much. The other thing I wanted to comment on, I won't go into great depth, but um, this, this whole trial of Mr. Trump and what it means. Um, first of all, I think I want to remember Dennis Dillon today. Dennis Dillon was our district attorney here in Nassau County, Long Island, New York, for 30 years. A devout Catholic and a great, great man. But I remember it kind of horrified me because I think of the justice system as so pure when he said to me, as a prosecutor, I could indict a ham sandwich if I wanted to. I could convince a grand jury and a jury of almost anything. I mention that because the fact that someone is convicted doesn't necessarily mean that they got a fair trial. And I'm not saying I'm for or against Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump. I am part of that 70% of Americans who sure wish this year in our presidential election we had two different candidates. So I'm not some kind of Trump ally. But I watched this trial in a place where over 80% of the people in Manhattan voted against Mr. Trump in the last election. I looked at them waiting until literally months before a national election in which he is the leading candidate against the incumbent president. And I have to say, I'm suspicious about the motive of why he was brought to trial now on a, an action he's supposed to have taken years ago, something that was never pushed before by earlier justice departments. Why are we putting this guy on trial now? Especially as in many polls, he leads the incumbent president and he might very well end up being our next president. It sure looks like a political trial. It sure looks like we're using the justice system as a weapon against the candidate who has a decent chance of being our next president. It looks like something worthy of a third world republic or Russia. It doesn't look like something America does. You know, if I can go back in time, one of the things I loved about Gerald Ford was that he had every reason in the world to allow Richard Nixon to go on trial for the things he did wrong through Watergate. But Mr. Ford ultimately probably cost him his re-election Mr. Ford pardoned Nixon, and he said this, a former president in jail is something that divides our country terribly. I don't want America to be divided. And so, yes, I'm going to forgive or pardon Mr. Nixon, whatever he may have done, because the unity of our country as a family is more important than making a point by locking up a former president. I wish our current administration had the same mindset as the good man that Gerald Ford was. I'm not sure if Mr. Trump did or did not do what he's accused of. What I do know is the timing is awful and it smells bad. It smells unjust. And again, for the record, I'm not a fan of Biden's or Trump's. I just call it like I see it. And I'm deeply troubled by what's happened this past week. And finally, another death I want to talk about. And this young man's a man of the name of uh, uh, Johnny Wachter. Now, those of you who are soap opera fans, especially if you watch General Hospital, would know him because he has starred on that show. He's 37 years old, and in between jobs, he works as a bartender to pay his bills. This is in Los Angeles, and if you don't know the story, it's, it's horrific. He comes out from the bar with some of his friends, and his car is being hit on by criminals who are trying to take his catalytic converter. He calls out to them, obviously realizing that his car is being robbed, and they shoot him and kill him. This man who died literally for a Catholic converter makes me so mindful of what I've said to you before about Mother Teresa's very wise words. She says, America, you may be the richest country in the world, but you're also the poorest because you take the most vulnerable citizens in the world, namely the preborn child, and you terminate them by the millions. You may be rich, but you're so poor spiritually in not realizing the value of human life. And then she said something that I was reminded of with this killing of Johnny this past week. She said, America, if you can't protect the weakest of the weak, the most vulnerable, the most promising, the child in the womb, then what possible hope is there for the rest of us? So I wonder if the shooter in Los Angeles had any regard for human life at all. Or is he part of that culture of death where we really think that taking a human life doesn't matter? But it does. This young man, this man of promise, this wonderful young actor who did nothing wrong but park his car for the sake of a catalytic converter was cut down this week. 
and he's one of so many victims of violent crime in our society. And I have to believe that when people take guns and shoot innocent people, that it's a sign of the corruption of our sense of the sanctity and the value of every human life. When will we learn that every life from womb to tomb is sacred? All these news stories are a reminder to me of how far we have yet to go to become a society that truly celebrates and reverences life as God wants us to. As a people of faith, let's now together profess our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with trust and hope in the goodness of God, let's offer our prayers a petition. And the response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For the church, that the blood of Christ poured out for the world may be the cleansing grace which unites all God's people in his kingdom, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For our nation, that our citizens may be faithful to the Christian values on which it was founded, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For those members of our family and friends who have turned away from the practice of their faith, may they come to seek the true God of consolation and joy, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Patricia Valdaro, Paulette Sewell, babies Carmela and Liliana Arnone, Mia Mednick, Kathleen Manuel, we pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord hear our Lord. prayer. For all who have died, especially Owen Kilgannon, we pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For the intention of this Mass, for Frank Liberio, Lillian Connellan, the Purgatorial Society, Patty Senkin, Amelia Haberstro, Glenn Thomas, Richard Rosmarin, Christopher Baumler, Patrick Carter, and Giuseppe Tapaldo, whom we remember at this Eucharist, we pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayer. And let me, if I can, in addition to all the intentions mentioned, mention some more among those who are ill and the needs of God, God's healing grace. I pray for Jose, Joe Senna, for Glenn Hudson. I pray for you, Bertica of Seattle and Joe Falgiano. I pray for Tom Slade, Kathy Bordengo, Judge Anthony Falanga. I pray for Eddie Mullins and Mary O'Brien, for Tommy Burke and Tom and Patty Yanch, for Katie O'Connor, Angelo Clementi, Al Clementi, Leanne Lasanti. I pray for Kimberly Cusack and Christine Bauman. I pray for Michelle Leonhardt and Russell Castro Giovanni. I pray for Vincent Rienzi Jr. And in praying for the sick, I remember Roy Citrano and Sam Maggio. I pray for Susie and Vinnie Vignardi. I pray for Richard Monaco and for Herb Stouter, for Judy Alaco and Larry Meyer. I pray too for uh, uh, Richard Cardone and Janet Chevelle, for Robert Talaska and Thomas Mistretta, for Michael Helen, as well as Carmela and Catherine and Liliana, the twins, the Arnone twins. I pray for Michael, young man who's been battling leukemia, and for Sandra Slater, for Anne Marie de Blasio, for Linda Madrigo, for Dario Rivera. I pray as well for uh, Michael Chanover and Carol Paolo Eshandi and Kelly Lee Skibilia, for Virginia Rivera, Barbara and Ken Barsanti, 
Mary and Ken Johnston and family, for Tommy Swengross, for uh, Sally Belfi, Sarah Belfi, for, I pray too for Paulette Sewell, as well as Terry and John Schiara, Maria and Bob Cariola, Melissa Olberg, Sal Manzo, Larry Lewis, the, Pelot Pelot the Peritrine, Peritine and McShea families. I pray for Velio Bronzini and for Jack Campbell. Pray for uh, Linda and Frank Rosado, as well as Mrs. Kalinowski. I pray too for uh, Ben Salmonella and for George Rumi and for Bill and Fran DeVito. I pray among the sick for Brian Morelli and Barbara Coppola, Diane Nagel, my dear Diane, hoping and praying that you're getting better after your special surgery, for Violetta Garzima and family, for Barbara Deerberger, I pray for Dennis Donovan and Elaine Lantini and Peggy Folan. I pray for uh, uh, Charlie, uh, pardon me, Carmela and Liliana, for uh, Anthony Cardone, for Cora Tess Wilson, for Darlene DeChico and her continued well-being. I pray too for uh, all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. And I want to, if I can, also pray for those who have passed, if you'll just bear with me. I want to pray for Richard Jennings and Craig Scott and Bessie and TC Center, for Thomas Minter and Roland Rossi, for Jenna Tuller and Margie Smith. I pray for Tessie, Teresa Palmo, and Phil Corderaro. I pray for Frankie Cazetto and Isabella Glauda and Billy and Michael Sarasoli and their dad, Billy. I pray for Ray and Monica Carrison, for Margaret O'Connor Lasanti, for Bridget Clementi, for Cecilia and Nicholas Lasanti, for Irene and Tom Romano, for Ed June and Eddie Jandovitz, for Beverly Maggio. Among those who have died, I remember Regina Brighton, Justino Amarin, for Tom Sully O'Sullivan, for Alfred John Sicali. I pray for Emilio Alaco, Paul Struzieri, pray for Maria and Albert Covelli, Anna and Gary Gomes. I pray for all the deceased members of the Vignardi family. Pray too for Diana Mistretti, as well as James and Rita Volpe, Joseph Sardone, Gina Pelletier, Emily Lafaso, James Bobrowski. I pray for Chris Baumler and Betty Moore and Pauline Romano and Sylvia Christ. I pray for Beatrice Ferrari and for Millie Paradiso, for Mary Rockensees and James C. Williams. Pray for Suzanne Scanio, her dad Brian Hussey. I pray for Annette Salintro, as well as Judge Donald Belfi and Thomas Peter Lepresti and Joseph Walweber. I pray for Dennis and Joe Cooney and Richard Jennings and Jamie Scotto. Pray for Pam Amadeo, as well as Gina Pelletier. I pray too for Pauline McKenzie's parents and for Jeanette Chanover and for Rosalie Salco. Among those who have died, I remember Gussie Sino, for John, uh, John, Luke, and Helen Marr. Pray for George and Joan Skag Namilio, for Elvira Vaccaro, for Amy Haberstraw. Amy's a wonderful gal. She used to come to our 1030 every Sunday and passed away quickly, leaving her husband, Walter, who still comes to Mass every week to pray for her. Ralph Woythaler, my friend in Florida. Suzanne Mulligan, Susan Mulligan, Pat Sestar. I pray for uh, Mrs. Lang, as well as Dino Pierulli, uh, and Corinne Caracciola, and Emily Lafaso and Betty Moore. I pray as well for... Um, I think I pretty much finished the list. Marion O'Brien, and, and if I can just add an intention or two, my friend Bill Kane left me a message and said that uh, while I've been praying for her, Rosemarie Kane Dorsty has passed away, so we pray for her eternal life in heaven. And let me pray, as I mentioned in the homily, for some special intentions for Grayson Murray, who this past uh, week took his life, and for all those who are afflicted with the illness of depression, that they might find hope and peace, and that they might, if they are people who have taken their life like grace and find eternal peace in heaven. And I want to pray for that young actor from General Hospital, Johnny Wechter, and all victims of violence in our society and for an end to such violence. I pray too, speaking of violence, for all the war zones around the world, for the freedom of our friends in Ukraine, for the freedom of people in Taiwan and Hong Kong, I pray for an end to all the violence in the Holy Land, that people might learn to love one another and recognize there is one God. 
I pray too for our first responders, police and firefighters and EMTs. I pray for teachers who do their job in trying to form and shape the values of our kids. I pray for doctors and nurses and orderlies, those people trying to keep us healthy. I pray for our men and women in the armed forces for their safety and well-being. And I pray for your special intentions and mine. And let's put them all together as we offer them to our advocate before her son, Jesus. Let's turn to the mother of God as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. By the mystery of, this, mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the gifts we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord God, may the bread and the cup we offer today bring your church the unity, the peace, and the love they signify. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the true and eternal priest who established this unending sacrifice. He offered himself as a victim for our deliverance, and he taught us to make this offering in his memory. And as we eat his body which he gave us, we grow in strength. And as we drink his blood which he poured out for us, we are washed clean of our sin. Now, with all the angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, we sing the unending hymn of your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed. You are the fount of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts of bread and wine to make them holy so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death which he freely accepted out of love for you and me, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and gave you, Father, thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving chalice, and we thank you for counting us as worthy to be in your presence and to minister to you. Humbly, we pray that by partaking in the body and blood of Christ, we might all be united as one family by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world and make us grow in love together with Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. We ask you to bless and remember all of our brothers and sisters, all of our relatives and friends who've gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all and make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her devoted spouse, and with all the saints and martyrs and angels who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son and our brother, Jesus Christ the Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. 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 So just a few weeks ago, early in May, we had our first communions here at Our Lady Lord's Parish. Father Andy celebrated one Mass, I celebrated the others. We had a lovely big group of young kids. You watched them come up with a sense of awe and reverence and nervousness and delight because for the first time they're receiving the promised body of Jesus Christ. You and I received a long time ago and it's easy to grow complacent about how amazing it is that the Lord God should come to us under the form of bread and wine. In a spirit of thanksgiving for the gift of the Eucharist, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share that peace with one another. of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, 
but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. And so now let's pray our prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Just a, a few announcements, if I can. One is that on June 22nd, here at Our Lady Lewis Parish, we'll be having our casino night. And as I've mentioned to you before, this is the first significant fundraiser we've had for the parish since 2014. So I could certainly use your support. Uh, if you live on Long Island, you're certainly very, very welcome to come and join us that night. All the priests will be there to celebrate casino night. And uh, we'll, we'll bless your, your, your bidding so you win lots of money. But the important thing is just to give support to Our Lady Lord's Parish. It really is something we need. And if you live far away and you can't be a casino night, just pray for the success of our casino night so we can keep this beautiful parish alive and kicking. And if you want to just donate without even playing casino that night, your, your donation would be very welcome too. Uh, and then just to mention, as I have before to you, that uh, this coming Monday, Father Kevin will be back with us. You remember he left us months ago to go to rehabilitation after breaking his ankle, and he's in uh, much better physical shape now, so he's coming back after quite a while away. I know that for many of you who enjoy daily mass, you enjoy Father Anthony, Father Andy, and Father Kevin, so the team will be back this coming week. So pray for his safe return and his well-being as well as ours, too. And then, of course, as always, I, I'd like to invite you to be with us on Personally speaking, with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. If you happen to have Sirius XM, you can get it by going to the Catholic Channel 129 on Sundays, where they air our program three times, 7.30 in the morning, 9 in the morning, and 2.30 in the afternoon. But if you have a computer, you have access to Personally Speaking just by going to YouTube and typing in under the heading Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. And this week, uh, we're airing uh, an interview with two young men from Fordham University who have produced a wonderful documentary called Discerning the Call, Where's the Priesthood Been and Where's the Priesthood Going? Their film, by the way, you can watch just by going online and punching in discerningthecall.com and listen to the many, many people who are experts on where is the church going? Are we going to have priests in the future or not? What's the hope of the church? Where, we, where were we and where are we going to be? Uh, Cardinal Dolan also participates in that program. So th their names are Patrick Cullinan and Jay Doherty, Fordham students who have produced this wonderful documentary on the future of the priesthood. They're interviewed with us on Personally Speaking. And coming up next is Dan Loria. Many of you know Dan Loria because he was the star of that wonderful TV series called uh, The Wonder Years. I saw him on Broadway playing Vince Lombardi uh, as Lombardi. Uh, but a wonderful actor, you know him by immediately seeing his face. And he has a new play called um, uh, Just Another Day, about what it is to go through aging in America and the challenge, the fear of dementia. So Dan Loria, who both wrote the play and stars in it in New York, is talking to us about his own spiritual journey, his own life in the arts. Dan Loria, next week on Personally Speaking. Join us either by listening to us on Sirius XM, the Catholic Channel, or by going to a computer. We'd love to have you with us on Personally Speaking. Let's pray. Lord God, may the bread and the cup we have offered today give us hope and strength. You give us your body and blood in the Eucharist as a sign that even now we continue to share your life. May we come to possess it completely in the kingdom of heaven where you live forever and ever. Amen.
My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God. I will raise you up, and I will raise